if we haven't met yet, my name's Kale. I'm the campus pastor of our brand new Timber Grove campus out at 8200 Washington Avenue, where we celebrated for the first time ever Easter at Timber Grove last Sunday. And not only that, but we celebrated our three month birthday as well. These past We're few officially years. three months old. God is doing some incredible things in the young life of this new community. And we're there every Sunday, 9.45 a.m. So if you have any friends that live in the Timber Grove or Heights area, we'd love for you to tell them to come join us on Sunday mornings. And not only is God building up and building out this new community out in Timber Grove, but he's also simultaneously building out my family as well. Some of you may know that my wife and I, we welcomed our second child into the world about two months ago. He's a He's a little guy. His name's Drew. He is the cutest bunny that you have ever seen in your life. He is just such a joyful addition to our family. But way before this guy was born, way before his big sister was born, his mom and I, we locked eyes on each other. We looked each other dead in the eye and we swiped right. That's right. That's right, Kim and I's relationship started online on a dating app called Bumble. And, and if you're not familiar with Bumble, it's the, the Sadie Hawkins of dating apps. It's, it's the dating app where the girl has to initiate the conversation with a guy to, to weed out any creeps or weed out any unsolicited messages that one tends to get on dating apps. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask any girl that has online dated ever in her life. So, so we match online and, and Kim initiates the conversation. Look at those two lovebirds. She initiates the conversation and I ask her out on a date. And the following week, we go on our first date. So the day comes, I get, I get pretty excited. We go out to a local bar and, and we're having a drink together. And, and this date could not have gone better. Y'all. She is laughing at all of my jokes. She is having this authentic, engaging, awesome conversation. And so I let my guard down a little bit. I let my guard down a little bit and we're laughing at a stupid joke that I probably told. And, and I bend my head down like this. And I look up and her eyes are really wide. And I'm like, oh no, my wife hates bald guys. She hates him. I knew I should have worn that hat. I knew it. I knew that I should have done that. And this moment seems like an eternity. But then she keeps on laughing. We were good. She's good. My wife, she doesn't like a guy with a full head of hair. I'm thankful for that. But this date, it, it couldn't have gone better. So naturally, after the date, I ask her if she wants to go across the street to grab some dinner. And then she says no. And so I'm confused. I feel like I've completely misread the date. My insecurities start flaring up. But then she says, but I'd love to go on a date and dinner with you next week. I said, okay, so I'm pretty happy, but I'm a little confused. But but little do I know, I, I learned this later, my wife, she had a hard and fast rule to not go to dinner on the first date. That is wisdom. But my wife has wisdom. So that was the last first date that we ever had. I ended up proposing nine months later. We got married nine months after that. And we go on this awesome honeymoon. And we come back thinking we are the perfect match and we have the perfect marriage. That thought lasted one week. It lasted one week. We come home from our our honeymoon. We move into our new house. And the very first thing that my wife wants to do is she wants to buy a barbecue grill. She wants to buy an outdoor barbecue grill for our little back patio. So I say, that's great. We go online, we look at Lowe's and and we pick out a barbecue grill. But the only thing is I tell her, I don't think this is gonna fit in my Explorer. I don't think it's gonna fit. I think we need to make arrangements to, to move it another day. And she says, no, no, no. I've seen this in person. I know it's gonna fit. She's adamant. She wants this grill today. We're having people over that night. She wants it today. So we drive over to Lowe's. We buy the grill. 
I wheel the grill out to my car, and what happens? It doesn't fit. So I go back into Lowe's, and, and if you're a guy, I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but it's one of the most shameful moments in my life. I go into Lowe's Home Improvement, and I ask to borrow a screwdriver. So, so I'm, I'm having this walk of shame out of Lowe's with the borrowed screwdriver, and I'm, I'm unscrewing the handles and the wheels and anything else. I have no idea what I'm doing, but this thing's going to fit in my car. So I'm gearing up to put this in my car, and as I'm lifting it up, the entire bottom of the grill comes crashing down onto Kim's foot crashing down. So I do what any loving newlywed husband would do. I I get down on my knees. I ask her if she's okay. I I wrap it with a bandage. I go get some ice, make sure she's okay. I didn't do that. I don't know what possessed me to say this, but I whispered under my breath, I told you it wasn't going to fit. I said, I told you it wasn't going to work. My wife, she looks at me dead in the eye with tears running down her face. And she says, you know what? If you keep acting like this, our marriage isn't going to work. The honeymoon was over. It it was over. And that was was such an eye-opening moment for me. That was such a wake-up call for me just to to think how selfish, how, how impatient, how short I can be with my wife. And... And look, God's still still working on me. I've I've got a lot farther to go. God's got a lot of work left to do, but but by his grace, I'm moving closer and closer and closer to love my wife the way that he loves her. This this self-sacrificing, this self-giving, this patient, a cross-shaped love. And, And so I'm excited to open up this new sermon series that we're starting today. And it's titled The Cross-Shaped Life. And what we're doing is in light of Easter last weekend, in light of the tomb being empty, in light of Jesus being alive, how do we, how do we practically live that out? How do we let the Holy Spirit shape our character by the cross of Jesus Christ? How do we do that? And so today we're talking specifically about how to live out a cross-shaped marriage. How to live out a cross-shaped marriage. And if you're not married, don't think this message doesn't apply to you. Don't tune me out for the next 20 minutes. This message, it applies to all of us. Because the foundational concept of marriage, it's discipleship. And discipleship, it applies to all of us. The the relationship between a husband and a wife, it's guided by the same principles of our relationship with Christ. The Apostle Paul, he he puts it like this. The Apostle Paul, by the way, never married. This is Ephesians 5. Paul says, for this reason, a man will leave his mother, his father and mother, and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ Christ and the church, he's saying that marriage is a glimpse of how Jesus can shape and transform us in our relationship with him. It's a glimpse that it's about discipleship. And and look, you're probably already discipling your married friends right now. Who do married people go to when, when they're exhausted and worn out and their marriage is on the brink of disaster? They, They go to their single friends. to to live vicariously through them. So whether you're married or not, I hope that this message might prepare you to minister to your married friends. And if we're honest, we don't even know what a cross-shaped marriage looks like. We don't even know what it looks like. We've been discipled by the world to think that that all of our marriage, all of our marriages should be a me-shaped marriage. That, that your marriage is centered around you. And there are three things that a, that a me-shaped marriage says. And, and the first thing that a me-shaped marriage says is, is that my marriage is a pain. That my marriage is a pain because it's not meeting my needs. It's the thorn in my side. 
My marriage, it's, it's just too familiar. And familiarity, it breeds contempt and resentment. And resentment, it is so destructive to how the Holy Spirit wants to shape your character and your marriage. Resentment is destructive. There's this couple at the story. They're, they're some of my favorite people. Their kids are a little bit older than Kim and I's. And, and we were talking one night and the wife really opened up to us. She said, you know, early on in our marriage, I resented my husband. I hated him. Every time we would go out to a, to a dinner party or to a social outing, I would come home and I would just resent him. And look, her husband, he's, he's a friend of mine, but he's a lot to handle. He, he's a lot. He's, he's the life of the party, center of attention, gregarious, sometimes outspoken, pretty loud guy. Picture me times 100, right? And she would say early on in their marriage, they would go out to dinner or a party and her, her husband would work the room. They would leave, everyone would know his name and they'd come home and she would just be so critical of him. She would just resent him. She said it almost killed their marriage. But then she had this shift in thinking. She said, you know, my husband is uniquely gifted and wired. And so instead of being so critical of him, I'm gonna celebrate those unique giftings and wirings. It's part of the reason I married him in the first place. She said it completely changed their marriage. She said that it probably saved their marriage. And the thing that stuck out to me in this story, it's, it's how rare that this shift in thinking is. That, that nine times out of 10, the, the spouse that's filled up with resentment and just lets it fester, they just give up because their marriage is too big of a pain. So the first thing that a, that a me-shaped marriage says is, is that my marriage is a pain. And the second thing, it says that my spouse is the problem. That my spouse is the one that's making my life miserable. My spouse is the one that's making our marriage miserable. If only they were more loving. If only they were more sexually responsive. If only they made more money. If only they were less controlling. If only they took care of themselves better. If only they did this, then our marriage would be great. And it's so easy to point out all the flaws, all the mistakes that our spouse has instead of looking internally and realizing that, that you're part of the problem. There's this great quote in the re-engage curriculum that we have. And, and that's the curriculum that we use every fall for our marriage class at the story. And my favorite quote in the book it says, one of the best ways to improve your marriage is by drawing a circle around yourself and work on fixing everyone in that circle. Work on fixing everyone in that circle. And what that doesn't look like is you standing in this circle and yelling at your spouse, look at this cross that I have to bear for you. Love bears all things, especially your mistakes and your lies. Look at me. That doesn't help or change anything. You know what that is? That sentimental glorification of victimhood and that perpetuates the cycle. Your spouse is not the problem. They're not. And the third thing that a me-shaped marriage says is that I'm not happy, so I'm out. My marriage, it, it doesn't make me happy anymore, so I'm done. And this is the counsel that the world will give you. This is the counsel that some counselors will give you. This is, this is what some of your friends will tell you. Hey, if, if your marriage isn't making you happy, then you should get out and hear me. This is foolish counsel. It's foolish counsel. What if God intended for our marriages, what if he intended to make us holy more than happy? What if you decided to pursue holiness in your marriage instead of chasing after happiness? We see all throughout the Bible, we see holiness. It's, it's the defining characteristic of God. It's so much more than, than just being good. It's so much more than just being morally upstanding. 
It's, it's purifying things that are otherwise impure. God says, be holy like I am holy. Jesus commands us, he says, be perfect like your father in heaven is perfect. This, this call to holiness, it's to set you apart from your sin. It's to set you apart. And it will, if you let it over time, it will lead to fewer mistakes and to fewer lies. The, the longer that I've, I've been married to Kim, the, the longer that we pursue holiness together, the fewer mistakes I make and, and the fewer lies that I believe. If you're pursuing holiness in your marriage, happiness will follow. It'll follow. And it'll be a deeper, richer, it'll be a better thing than you could have ever imagined. Holiness, it's the, it's the desired destination of every disciple of Jesus. It's the desired destination. And your marriage can be a vehicle that God can use to make you holy, but not just any marriage, a cross-shaped marriage. And the author of Hebrews they, they lay it out for us perfectly. Here's what it says. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This isn't just what a cross-shaped marriage looks like. This is the whole gospel. This is the whole gospel. We, we can break it down. Those first few words, for the joy set before him. That's this vision of future joy. It's not, it's not this vision of future joy when we're dead and we're, we're in heaven. It's this future joy in an hour, in a month, in a year, in a decade, in 50 plus years. Happiness and joy, they are two different things. Happiness, it's a feeling, but we're not talking about a feeling. Happiness, it's, it's fleeting bliss, but joy is eternal peace. Joy is, is looking at your life, and even though it might be upside down, it might feel like it's, it's falling apart, it's having, it's having peace in that moment. It's thanking God no matter the circumstance that you're in. It's still being being grateful to God, no matter how difficult the situation is that you're in in your life. A cross-shaped marriage, it's not a perfect marriage. A joyful marriage, it's, it's not a marriage without trials. The joy that's set before you in your marriage, it's the fuel to love your spouse even when they're impossible to love. It's the fuel. When I think of the joy that's set before me in my marriage. I think of Kim and I, we're on the back porch. We're, we're 85 years old. We're old and gray. I definitely don't have any hair. And, and we're on our rocking chairs. We've got a barbecue grill next to us. And, <laughs> and we're just looking at each other. We're, we're drinking our Activias. I don't know. We're Eating Werther's, I'm, I'm not sure, but, but we're looking at each other. And we can see all the storms that we've weathered. We know all the difficult times that we've been through, everything that life has thrown at us. And we, we look at each other and we can say that we made it. We can say that we made it. We probably don't even have to say those words. We just look at each other and we know. And we can see the, the image of God so much more clearly in each other because, because he shaped us and molded us into his character and to who he's called us to be. That's what I'm chasing. That's the joy that's set before me in my marriage. So the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus suffered and it produced joyful endurance. If we suffer well, then how much more can we rejoice in the good times? How much more? 
But if we don't suffer well, if we don't persevere, then the very next verse in Hebrews tells us what will happen. It says that you will grow weary and lose heart. And that's in your faith and in your marriage. That you will burn out. And so will your marriage. There is no such thing as neutral. You're not in neutral. You're either growing together in your marriage, closer to your spouse, pursuing God, or you're drifting away. You're either in your faith, you're either drawing closer to God, looking to him, or you're falling away. You either have joyful endurance or you're losing heart and giving up. You have to fight for your marriage. You have to fight for it. And we fight by scorning its shame. Shame stripped away every earthly support that Jesus had. His disciples, his friends, they abandoned him. They ran away. They were ashamed to call him a friend. He laid naked and ashamed on a cross in front of his mom and everyone else. And by walking out of that tomb, Jesus scorned his shame and showed us how to scorn ours too. He showed us how we can be free. The, the world's idea of freedom, it's, it's to avoid shame. It, it's to run away from it. But Jesus, he's teaching us a better way. He's saying not to run from it, not to accept it and move on, but to scorn it, to fight against it. Anyone who chooses a cross-shaped marriage they will face shame. Maybe even from, from the people that are closest to you. They'll, they'll shame you for, for staying in a marriage that's not fulfilling you in that moment. At some point in every marriage, you'll be faced with a choice. You can choose to say that, that I'm not happy, so I'm out. Or you can bear your cross, scorn its shame, and resurrect your marriage. You can fight for your marriage. You can fight for it. You can fight for it by, by praying with your spouse out loud in front of your kids. You can fight for your marriage by, by deciding right now to stop being so critical of your spouse in front of all of your family and all of your friends. You can decide right now to love your kid's mom so much to show your kids how much you love their dad. You can fight for your marriage right now by scorning the shame, by rejecting the lie that your spouse isn't good enough for you. Every marriage has to deal with shame. You can either surrender to it and kill your marriage, or you can scorn it and resurrect it. And then, at the end of every storm, you can sit down, completely worn out, exhausted, tired, and completely satisfied in the presence of God. Just like Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And this is how the gospel works throughout every season of life, throughout every season of your marriage. From, from sunrise to sunset, every day of your life and your faith. And in your marriage, from your wedding day until death do you part. My wife and I, we, we haven't been married for very long. But we've experienced some, some really significant things together. We've experienced some really big fights. We've experienced floods. We've experienced funerals. We've experienced completely changing careers when we stepped into ministry a couple years ago and, and the pay cut that came with it. We've experienced incredible joy with our two children. And, 
we've experienced loss with a miscarriage and, and losing our baby and, and the pain and the grief that comes with that. We've experienced a pandemic together and, and we didn't kill each other. We experienced an ice storm a couple months ago with a toddler and a one-week-old baby. During the season, we've, we've been closer than we've ever than we've ever been before. And last fall, we went through the roughest patch that, that we've ever gone through in our marriage. Most of us think that, that, a, that a healthy Christian marriage is, is holding hands with our spouse and then inviting Jesus in and holding hands with Jesus and, and doing this little dance And it's like Jesus is the third wheel in our otherwise happy marriage. But a cross-shaped marriage, it's when both people are are clinging on to Jesus with both hands, holding on for dear life, looking to the one who endured the cross, who scorned its shame, and who sat down at the right hand of God. If you're here and and you feel like you're in a hopeless marriage, or if you're here and and you haven't really thought about your marriage in a long time and and, and you're coasting and and you feel like you've been in neutral, but, but when really you've been drifting far away for far too long, or if you're here and and you're a newlywed or you're engaged or you're going through a really great season in your marriage, This verse, whether you're married or not, this passage, these 25 words, it's a reminder of the whole gospel. It's a reminder that that in every season of life, we have to cling to Jesus. That, That we can choose to believe that there is joy set before us. That we can, we can joyfully endure. We can scorn shame. And we can rest in the presence of the holiness of God. That's what Jesus is inviting you into today. Jesus is inviting you to take that next step. Take that next step towards him because you are not neutral. You're either taking a step forward or you're taking a step back. So take that next step forward today. Jesus is inviting you to take that next step in your life, in your marriage, with your spouse, in your faith, looking and pursuing a holy God. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful that we can pursue a holy God that we can look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith, who endured the cross, who scorned its shame, and who sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, we're thankful no matter what season that we find ourselves in right now, that you are good and that you are for us. God, give us the courage to take that next step towards you today. We're thankful. It's in Jesus' name.